This is Audiovisual Cultures, the podcast that explores different areas of the arts and culture of production with me, Paula Blair. Visit patreon.com forward slash AV cultures to find out more and to join the pod. So hello and thank you for tuning in to another Audiovisual Cultures. In this episode, I have the great pleasure of talking to fellow podcaster Nathan Ragland about the Postmodern Art podcast. I'm going to bring you straight in. Nathan, very warm welcome. How are you today? I am doing wonderful. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to sit down and chat. Um, it's honestly an honour. Oh, so. <laughs> we don't know if I go that far, but I will take the compliment. <laughs> <laughs> so whereabouts are you based, Nathan? I am based in United States, Georgia, close to the Atlanta area, but like at least a good couple hours away. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. The first person I've spoken to from that area of the US. That's very exciting for me. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So it's out, it's out. nice, nice. I, I, it's, again, it's an honor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the very tiny UK, very far away from you. I mean, you say that, but I mean, even then, you know, there's a lot of culture, a lot of history when it comes to the UK. So even that little bit, little area in the UK, there's a lot to delve into there. That's very true. We can probably get into quite a lot of big areas because um, I find you on Reddit and I find what you were doing really interesting because I think it's not a million miles away from what I've been trying to do as well with mm-hmm. audiovisual cultures. And um, I really liked your idea of trying to focus on people who aren't necessarily getting talked about but are doing really great work. And I'm trying to do something very similar here. And I think the pandemic situation has made my podcast a bit more international which is great because I'm talking to people like you and I never really thought of doing that before oh absolutely uh, if I may I, it's one of those I actually started my podcast partially because of the pandemic because I was you know getting so cooped up inside and wanted to at least talk to people but it's also like you know sharing my love for appreciation for these artists that you know they may already have an audience but my main thing is giving them the platform that they deserve because you see so much in the industry of art in general of people like loving the art but giving no love to the artist the people that spend the time and effort to actually do this kind of stuff and like you i've got to talk to so many different people from all over the world that i never would have had the chance to beforehand i've talked to several people in the uk uh some of which are adorning my wall right now i've talked to a video game developer who just started in mexico i talked to an animator all the way over in the philippines if you told me even five years ago yeah you're gonna be talking to people from the philippines and such i'd be like uh, okay is is am i like a flight attendant or something like that like what's my occasion <laughs> Yes, it is funny how things have turned out because mine was a very, felt a very local affair, local at least to the UK or wherever I happen to be. So yeah, it's been strangely for some of us, it has just expanded our scope of what we can do with our work so yeah it's great to hear that too so nathan would you just outline then for us postmodern art podcast you tell me you give me your bylines you tell me what's going on there with that oh absolutely uh well like i touched on the postmodern art podcast is the podcast dedicated to giving artists who are wowing the world over the platform they deserve i am very active on the internet and i see a lot on the internet and i feel like i want to try to spread more love to the internet especially with How bipolar the internet can be at times. No, it's one of those, I I bring on artists every week that I admire. I have them sit down and I have them sort of give a face behind the artwork that you can see out there. You know, I've talked to several people over and it's just wonderful to have them sit down and just have them basically gush about their passion. Talk about what they love, why they love it, what got them into it, you know, what they have planned, what they want to see in the world. Just have them just go all out with it. And I'm also in that process, like exposing people to new artists and maybe even new forms of art at the same time. You know, I've gotten animators, people that have done like commission work or thumbnails for YouTubers. I've had, uh, like I said, video game designers. A couple weeks back, I even had a wrestler on. So like, you know, have them talk about the art of wrestling because there is an art form to that. So yeah, just more or less giving artists a spotlight and expanding a person's ideals on what art can be. Yeah, fantastic. Again, I feel a real affinity with that because that's really similar to what I'm trying to do with audiovisual cultures. You, I take a very loose borderless approach to what 
could be considered as audio and or visual culture. So I think we're on oh, yeah. quite similar ground there. So I'm really glad to hear somebody else being really open minded about what they're considering as art, you know, and that's such a massive question. Oh, no, absolutely. It's one of those, you know, a chance that, like I said before, a chance that more respect can be given to the people that usually don't get a lot of respect. I think any opportunity there is out there that's trying to light, go ahead and shine it as bright as possible. I actually sat down and listened to a couple of your episodes before I decided to sit down. I love what you're doing as well, given, you know, letting them talk. But I feel like there's more of a, I don't know if it's just more of an intellectual look at it, which I appreciate more than anything else. Yeah, I suppose that's just as you've raised it there. I mean, I've come from an academic background, Mm -hmm. you know, so uh, like, how did you find your way to making the the postmodern art podcast? Well, I mean, I also have somewhat of an academic background with this kind of stuff. I, I went to college for mass media, so like TV, film, all that jazz. But I never really thought about a podcast until like I was online. Not my, as much as I do have an academic background, this is more of a, I want to say bluegrass raised kind of podcast in a way. Maybe. I don't know. Um, <laughs> no, it's one of those like I decided to, to develop the podcast because online, you know, I you, know, you see all like the horror stories of like, you know, these big companies, you know, taking it, you know, pushing these workers, you know, pushing these animators or pushing these designers to their limit and then just turning around and like closing down the studio or, you know, just shutting them out of all sorts of stuff. Or like you see these incredible shows that people love, but like the executives are like, yeah, no, we're not going to even go forward with this thing. So I wanted to find a way i know it's not gonna be immediate but i wanted to find a way to bring on some of these amazing people give them a spotlight and just be like yes you make incredible art tell people why you make incredible art have people fall in love with you as much as they love your art more than anything else because i i I, i'm a big person when it comes to like passion and stuff i could have gone to school for a million different things but i decided to go with what i was passionate about which was filmmaking and such so the fact that you know i a lot of people nowadays, they try to go with what could be safe for them compared to what they want to do. So any chance I can get a person that took that risk and is going with what they're passionate about and living the life that they want to, even if it's not, you know, the end goal that they envision in mind, but the fact that they're going for their passion more than anything else, it inspires me and I want to help inspire others that may not know about that path just yet. Fantastic. Great work. I wanted to ask you as well about the title. How did you come up with the title for your podcast and what exactly is going on there? Because I feel like there's some layers to peel back. Oh, oh, there is. Thank you for asking this question because I think I've only mentioned this once in a podcast and I absolutely love that. So you and I both know that the postmodern art is a movement that happened, correct me if I'm wrong, like somewhat in the late 1900s. So like, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, somewhere in that general area. Yeah, you know, maybe a little earlier. Basically, it was a very uh, important movement that obviously followed the modern movement but I decided to do it as more of a twist on like modern day society because we live in the 21st century and a lot of our stuff we upload online you know we put on Twitter Instagram such we post it so basically with the title I'm encouraging people to post their modern art yeah no I like it yeah because I think especially the way I think grammatically the way it's written <laughs> it's not postmodern it's postmodern you know it's separate words there's no hyphen you exactly. know so I thought no there's something going on here so I figured it was something along those lines so thank you for uh explaining that i was gonna say to even delve one little step further i kind of implied that with the logo that i have with it if you notice the logo it's like the post and art are like digital are different fonts than modern podcasts so like just the post art is a thing that people will instantly notice yeah that's it there's so much going on there with the word post anyway you know that idea of it coming after Mm -hmm. something and then does it mean it's just after chronologically or is it reacting to it and you even just the term postmodern has so much debate around it still and there's just so much scope for you to play around with that I think which is nice oh no absolutely trust me you know I I guess that's also part of the beauty of art it could be interpreted in a million different ways if you look at it hard enough that's it yeah so no it's quite nice and it is nice if people see your logo and maybe we can pick that on some of the promo cards and stuff for when this episode's going out just to show people oh absolutely 
I'm sure I'm sure send you the, the little PNG of it beforehand so you can go ahead and do what you need to do with oh, it. Oh, thanks. Yeah, because it is, it's, it's, the graphics are great on it. You know, they're really, it really captures all of what you've just said there, I think, really nicely. And yeah, you can play around with the words and the order and what is art, what is post art, what is modern art, what is post modern art and all of that, you know, so it's great. And then what's a podcast, podcast <laughs> in there exactly as well, an art podcast, a modern podcast. Podcasts yeah. and because it's such a young medium as well it's becoming itself all the time oh no absolutely i mean you know podcasting i think i think it's definitely exploded because of the quarantine because people have probably thought about doing this stuff for the longest time but what was it i heard somewhere i think it was on the apocalypse now podcast that basically podcasts are today's version of the uh what was it called what was it like state funded tv or something like mm. that like you know like the programs that like the little mom and pops would do for like the local stations and such they'd see like three o'clock in the morning like that's basically what the podcast community has become it's one of those we're making the stuff that we want to make and if, even if it's only like 10 people like with their ears or to it or whatnot that's more people than we probably anticipate whenever we decide to make the show because this is the stuff that we love at the end of the day i'm making the podcast that i want to make so why not yeah that's it i heard you say that in one of your more, more recent episodes as well and mm -hmm. i thought yeah that again that really chimes with me because a bit like you i identified a gap and i thought i want to hear a podcast about this and i don't think it exists i can't find it so i will have a go at trying to make one <laughs> I mean, absolutely. I mean, think about it. The only time you ever really get like a behind the scenes kind of thing for anything involving art is whenever Disney is pushing out on their social media, like the behind the scenes of their animation. And even then it's like the director, maybe the voice who all they really did was give the voice. And that's probably about it. You're not, you know, really talking to the people that did the story report. You're not talking to the people that are in charge of the in-betweens, people that are in charge of making sure the CGI or the 3D animation didn't glitch out 20 million different ways. That's why I want to see more than anything else, just kind of how it got from point a to point b with the like a1 a2 a4 you know a29 all the way back there along the way yeah definitely yeah there's so many different elements of creating and producing cultural objects cultural artifacts mm -hmm. you know so as you say like a film especially and if it's an animated film or it involves cgi or something there's huge teams of people oh no absolutely you know there's there's all departments just doing leaves do you know <laughs> I recently, I was gonna say, I recently discovered, like, I never thought about it, but it makes sense after the fact. One of the first episodes I had, I discovered that there was a department of art that their main responsibility is like lighting and shadow in animation. Like, you never think about that stuff. Like, even the person that I interviewed was like, I just thought that stuff happened, which is compositing for those that don't know. But it's like, you know, it blows my mind. Like, you know what? Like, even with 2D animations, that makes so much sense. I thought that was just part of what the animators did, but like, no, there's a separate department fully dedicated to that. Yeah, because I think it takes huge amount amounts of research to learn exactly I think especially if you look at Pixar's development for example like oh, yeah. over 30 years I mean they're producing photorealism these days and if you go back right to Toy Story it's what is this it's so different you know and <laughs> how they've developed you know you think of a bug's life and how they did the shadows and they use the translucence of them and then you know I watched Toy Story 4 recently I was a bit late to that party but you know Toy Story 3 broke me so it took me a while to <laughs> <laughs> oh, trust me, I'm, I'm I'm still on that broken train with you, and I haven't watched Toy Story 4. I'm aware of what happens. I just haven't sat down and watched it. Well, so. I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> I thought it was brilliant. Like, I just thought it was a roller coaster. I thought it was a really great story. But anyway, <laughs> I've derailed this already. But yeah, just that example of how intricate the work is of every department that can make a product like that oh, and then yeah. i think with the sorts of things that you're talking about as well where people are you know sort of more like indie producers as well where they're doing that sort of work but on their own steam or independently or you know however it is they're doing it you know because you talk to a lot of people who put a lot of really intricate stuff out on youtube and it's like you say it's a bit like public access television and we've now that's the world's looking for 
public yeah. access, access. Thank you. I was wondering what that was. <laughs> Just that democratization. So very similar to how public access television had brought a little bit of democratization into who could make television. We now have that with mm -hmm. Internet 2.0, you know, and so many of us are able to use the equipment at our disposal and produce pretty decent stuff on our own. And we've realized that we don't have to be tethered to the big companies. You know, I saw a big hoo-ha on Twitter earlier today about Adobe because they've been charging people incredible amounts. Oh, yeah. and I was going to say, we all know that they charge incredible amounts. It's the fact that they're trying to charge people for canceling yeah. their description incredible amounts, which is insane. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, because I was somebody who was very sort of thought, oh, I have to save up to get Adobe Creative Cloud someday. And then I've just researched and researched and researched and found all this open source, completely legal technology and mm -hmm. software and everything that I can use. And then when I have the money, I can donate to those creators to help keep them going. Do you know? And it's there's no difference. So you maybe don't have as many of the tools, but you've still got enough tools to do something like this, a conversational podcast, you know? So anyway, that was a massive tangent there. <laughs> No, I mean, it's, I mean, it's a good tangent, if I may also build up on it a little bit. I, I was going to say, I know for me personally, I don't use Adobe when it comes to editing the podcast. I use a separate software called Movavi or something like that to where it's like, is it as good as Adobe? No, I'll be the first to admit that. But it gets the job done because of what I'm trying to do with this podcast compared to like a filmmaker or something along the lines of that. But even then, like, you know, you said yourself, you know, you want to turn around and also give back to these creators to try to support them. I try to do that to this day with my podcast as well, because I'm sure if whenever you notice going through the catalog, you notice the thumbnails and such how each of them were like different and vibrant and you know a million different ways i usually try to ask the artists i bring on or just a separate artist in the art community hey i want to try and find a way to represent your art this is the best way i could think of right now is okay if i commissioned you for it and with all but like a couple who offered most of them have a I, i've made sure to commission them for the opportunity because again this is the thing that they do this is the thing that they dedicate themselves to i am not going to take advantage of them and not pay them for doing something for little me yeah that's a really lovely idea to do that i mean and that's a whole other issue as well is i mean how do you feel as a as an indie podcaster do you get support for what you're doing as well like we have so little access to funding streams to do our work because what we do as well in making this is labor too but also mm -hmm. like you say i mean that's something where i feel very conscious of that as well of we're asking people to give us their time and their voice and their ideas and we can't necessarily I mean I certainly am not in a position necessarily to pay a fee and so many artists especially even from organizations who can afford to pay them they're asked to work for free all the time because it's the kudos yeah. of it the love of it should be enough we see the horror stories out there more than anything else but I mean it's absolutely insane how little respect some people actually do get I, I actually brought on an artist uh, a while back her name is Kihori uh, she is an animator from the Philippines I was talking about she was talking about about how when she first had her first animation job, they worked her like to the bone. I'm talking about like several hours and overtime. And on average per week, she would be paid 50 bucks a week. That's not 50 bucks per day. That's not 50 bucks. Mm. That's per week. Can you live off of 50 bucks a week? No. It was so bad for her that she actually fell out of animation. Like there was a point to where she was like, I don't love this anymore because they're working me for basically next to nothing. And like, which luckily for her, she stumbled upon YouTube thumbnails working for a YouTuber and has only recently got back into animation because she had that itch. And luckily she's working with a wonderful independent crew that is making sure that she is compensated well for her responsibilities because that's how you're supposed to do it. You know, it, it, it's hard for a lot of artists to get a lot of respect because I feel like there's sort of like that disconnect that you know talk about like people love the art but they don't really care about the artists themselves that's part of the reason why I wanted to do this podcast to sort of bridge that gap to let people know hey there are humans that are making this stuff before you know behind what you're doing and I want you to know that they deserve all the love time for their time effort and hard work that they put into the stuff that you love yeah, absolutely. It's a small thing to be able to just give them that platform and, and let them speak and talk about their work. But hopefully it helps. And I don't I don't know. How do you feel about that? I mean, I, I mean, at least for me right now, I don't know how much it's helping because I'm not that but I've only just recently started this thing in September and I hadn't even hit 100 subscribers mm. yet. Am I saying that I'm making the direct impact in the world right now and I'm giving them that love? No. 
but at the same time, you know, it, it's not like I was going to be, it, it's not like I went to thinking I was going to be the next Joe Rogan. <laughs> and I was going to bring on freaking, what's the biggest name? Like I'm like my first episode. Yeah. I'm bringing on Dwayne, the rock Johnson <laughs> to talk about his one voice. He did Moana and producing stuff, which I would love to have him on and love to have him talk about like producing stuff. Cause there is an art to that, but I knew that that wasn't going to be the case, but I also know that with a lot of these artists, I was talking about this with a separate thumbnail artist. Her name is a uh, little hip. No lover to death. She was a great guest to have on, but like at the end of every podcast, I usually try to praise the artist because again, I love their art and I brought them on for a reason. And, you know, one of the things that she was talking about after I gave my praises, you know, she was honestly touched with what I saying because for her, you know, again, she's a thumbnail artist. So for her, it's like, do the thumbnail. Okay. It's up. And we go on to the next one because for them, it's like, you know, a daily YouTuber or something along the lines of that. A lot of people don't click on YouTube videos to just because the thumbnail looks pretty although it does give a good first impression but it's not you know that's not always the case so for her to like hear that kind of stuff like it touched her and i was like that's the kind of thing i wanted to do you know i i know that my audience isn't huge right now but the little audience that i do have that does interact or whatnot they're incredible the support that they give to these artists and the support that they give me as well which i'm amazed by because i'm just trying to present people more than anything else but like i have i've got one person who on twitter goes Goes by purgatory ram and he keeps messaging me talking about like yeah you're an inspiration for like bringing on these artists you're actually inspiring me to really go for art and like try to do that and i'm like that is incredible to hear because that's it, like that's just one person that i'm actually getting the chance to talk to uh another person who goes by the name tipsy j hearts who i've actually brought on the podcast I've actually collaborated with her to like make some merchandise for my personal shop, you know, which I, it's something I've wanted to do. It is what it is, but at the same time, like, you know, she forever thanks me for like all the opportunities that I give her. And she forever thanks me for, you know, just being a good friend more than anything else. And I'm just like, I'm just being a human being for the, for you because of the incredible art that you're making. So I know I'm not going to get like the huge numbers and I'm not striving to get huge numbers. If I stay to where I only get 10, 15 views per single episode, screw it. That's my legacy, but I'm going to sit down, talk to these incredible people and let them know, at least from one firsthand experience, hey, your art is incredible. You should know it and you should know that we love it. And if other people jump on board with that kind of thing and at least one person is touched and inspired by that, my job is complete. I think that's really well put, Nathan. I think that's commendable. I think quite relevantly to this, I think quite recently, I was starting to feel really low about everything. You know, all mm. of this sort of stuff that you've just said there, I was starting to feel like, oh, I'm, I've been working so hard on all of this and I know I'm making a really good show and I've had amazing guests on and the world needs to hear about them. And uh, I just feel like I can't crack through. And then I just thought, well, I'm ignoring the people who do listen to me because my regular listenership may be quite small but they're there and oh, they yeah. matter to me and they've helped me and they're supporting me and they keep me going and they matter and I'm making this for me and I'm making it for them and anyone else who wants to join us and it just feels like well I kind of just had to realize like there are strata for these things because as you're saying you know although Mr. The Rock is very welcome anytime <laughs> I won't turn him away ever although he seems to be working out pretty hard at the moment according to yeah, Instagram yeah. <laughs> He's a bit busy, but, uh, you know, he's he's super, super welcome. But yeah, it's people like us who are trying to do something and our peers who are working their butts off to do their thing as well and to just try and give everybody that space and that space to communicate and to just share ideas because there's just so many of us now and there's so many amazing, oh, yeah. talented people and hardworking people and it's so good to just try to, to show, look, there are these people who make it and become the stars and become the A-listers but that doesn't mean that what we're doing isn't good or doesn't have value because maybe what we're doing might even be better depending on how you quantify it I don't know but you know it's important I was gonna say I, I know exactly what you're talking about with bringing on these incredible people and it seems like no one's watching one of the biggest guests like when it comes 
to like scope of what they've done. And one of the people that I was most excited to bring on was a guy by the name of, uh, well, there's two separate ones, but the first one's a guy by the name of Joe Horn. Does that name ring a bell to you? I don't think so, no. Have you ever heard of a show called Class of 3000? No, maybe no. it's a US thing. I it, it, might, it, it might be a US thing, but it's one of those, it's one of those like cult classic shows. Like it was on for okay. a couple seasons and no one really gave a lot of love to it, but like it was still like absolutely incredible and people absolutely loved it. But I'm sure you've also heard of stuff along the lines of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Sonic the Hedgehog and, and uh, the I don't know about the Boondocks, if you've heard of that show or not. I heard of it. You've heard of it. it. Fair enough. Joe Horn was a, at least a director for the entirety of the run of class of 3000 but he also directed a couple episodes of the boondocks he worked on like i said the original teenage mutant ninja turtles the original sonic the hedgehog series in like the 90s um he worked on peewee's playhouse for some of the animated segments that they had for them this guy had a lot of history behind him so it's like i was exactly so i was like i was super excited just to have him on i thought okay people are gonna recognize the stuff he was on maybe they're gonna want to listen about like the behind the scenes stuff which he had a lot of insight and i was so glad to have him on it was one of the most like spiritually fulfilling episodes to sit down and talk <laughs> with him more than anything else but when it initially came out i think there was only like 50 or 60 people that listen like views to the youtube video and i was like ah <laughs> like it, it crushed me a little bit but one it's actually boosted up to, I think it's actually got close to 200 views now but even then still it's like you know at the end of the day like I sit down I'm like I got to talk to one of the people that basically developed my childhood because I was a huge fan mm-hmm. of that class of 3000 show like if nothing else that was the experience that I walked away and I was like I have this now forever in my pocket it was a great experience I was lucky enough to bring a couple of my friends for that interview as well because they were also influenced by the show and we were all like getting together to, to meet up anyway so it's like I wanted to do this as kind of like my little Christmas gift to them. (laughs) But it's like, you know, it it was, it was a great experience that I would never take back for anything at this point. Mm -hmm. And and like, if that's what inspired me, I can only imagine like the thumbnail artist for one of the big YouTubers that someone may not know about, you know, a whole lot, you know, maybe the video only has like 12, 15 views, but at least one of those views is someone that wants to turn around and do that kind of art. I know that my audience may not be the most vocal and that's fine. You know, they've got lives and for some of them, they don't want to be as open on Twitter and stuff. That's completely understandable. But at the end of the day, like I know there's an audience there. I know people are loving what I'm pushing out and I really do hope that some of them stay and not only listen to the artists that they want to, but like go back and listen to some of the other artists, you know, some of the incredible people. Cause I've talked to so many people that I've like loved and admired. And again, if you told me, if you told me even like two or three, years ago yeah you're gonna talk to these incredible people i would have thought you were insane Uh, (laughs) because i mean (laughs) you know i like I said, I brought on Joe Horn. I brought on Left at London, who is a indie pop artist who I absolutely loved and admired for years. And the fact that I got to sit down, chat with her and like that conversation, that was like my third episode too. So it's like, that was very early on. And I was loving that one. It, it's insane what I'm getting to do more than anything else. It has become a real privilege, I think. I know for me as well, the people that opens me up to that I just wouldn't have, wouldn't have even thought, you know, I've talked to people who produce audio dramas talk to people who you know work in different kinds of music and yeah it's just opened up a world of even just cultural production that I wouldn't have thought of interviewing people who worked in those sorts of things it wouldn't have just come to my mind you know because I'm sort of from a very traditional film studies background as well Mm. so just opening yourself out as well to those possibilities I mean that's really fantastic being able to really chat and chat thoroughly to people who make things and again it's areas where I think when you're a kid and you're watching cartoons and stuff because I know that I had a healthy diet of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and stuff Mm -hmm. the really old ones from the 90s yeah I would be hugely excited to talk to that person as well you know and to learn about that because I think when you're a kid and you're absorbing all that it's just a thing that happens isn't it and you just don't know like we were saying earlier you don't think about the huge team of people the creative process that goes behind all of that you know so that's really exciting for you and and as well as that I mean you're building up skills you're mm-hmm. perfecting your interview technique and um you know I think we've landed on something very similar you know I prefer a very conversational approach as well and I think when people are relaxed and you know I think you get more information and it's a really nice listening experience to people because you can you listen to it and you go oh, they're getting on really well and this is a nice 
nice conversation because you almost feel like you're part of it. And I mean, I'm I'm a dork, so I'll you know start to talk <laughs> along with the podcast sometimes. I go, oh, that's so nice. Oh, that's really interesting. I go, what did they say that for? <laughs> I have a podcast for you if that's the kind of thing you're talking about, but like even more broad than what we do. There's a it, there's a podcast that I recently started listening to called Stranger Than Christian, which I I don't know if you've ever yeah, you're writing that down right now. I'm not done. <laughs> yeah. No, it's one of those like the guy literally just brings on right like he puts out a forum on like Reddit and stuff or like his own personal website, and he'll just bring on random strangers and they'll just talk for like an hour about whatever just comes up, like whether it be about their careers or like their oh. passions and all that kind of stuff. And like I've fully gone ahead deep i've only recently found out about it i've listened to just about every single episode so yeah. far <laughs> fantastic yeah it's good to find you know a podcast as well we just get hooked into it you know like i've got all my regulars that i'm very up to date with and then i will lose them for months because i find something and i have to do the whole thing because it's so good oh yeah no absolutely trust me i've been i haven't been that huge in the podcast before and even whenever i started my podcast like i i there was a couple i listened to here and there but i never really had a chance to fully like delve in and go all in on the indie podcast world but now that i'm like really into it like i've wanted to listen to others and i've wanted to you know get inspiration more than anything else and so some of the podcasts i find out there and some of the podcasts that uh even i've like appeared on i've appeared on a couple at this point right now one of them that's actually got their episode published but like the other one's coming out soon but even then like you know if i decide to jump in on a podcast like yours it's mm -hmm. one of those like i want to at least sit down and be like okay i love what this person's doing like awesome podcast stuff there was one that i actually interviewed for on saturday to where I never thought I would be interviewed for this kind of podcast. It was an agriculture podcast. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yes, but like the way that he's going about it is to promote agriculture literacy in the world, to sort, of, mm. sort of let people understand, you know, hey, agriculture is more than just, you know, working on the farm, you know, all that kind of stuff. Like mm. he's gone out of his way to sort of relate it to like music and Star Wars and all sorts of like pop culture stuff. I actually sat down with him because I wanted to see if there was a way that we could connect agriculture with art, because as an art podcast, mm -hmm. I wanted to, to increase that literacy as well. And like whenever we sat down and talk, it was amazing amazing how related the two worlds were you would never think like mm -hmm. you know agriculture mm -hmm. is or art is as integral as agriculture but like what was it we were talking about how like people didn't give a lot of love and respect to the respective fields and such especially like when the pandemic happened both of our fields they were really vital in helping people get through agriculture obviously we couldn't survive without the agriculture and art we would have gone crazy if there wasn't art for us to consume yeah excellent point yeah i think just on that i mean a, a good friend of mine who is an artist based in vancouver mm -hmm. sylvia grace border she has actually done quite a lot of artwork about agriculture and yeah. urban agriculture in um greater vancouver yeah it's a very sort of niche field i think <laughs> oh yeah no it, it very it is very niche and such but it's like it was awesome for us to find that connection but that goes back to my Definitely. point at the indie podcast out there and such like it's absolutely insane like was cropped up because of quarantine and such because for some of these people, it's like they've wanted to do this for ages. I've wanted to do something similar to this for a while. Like I said, I went to school for mass media. So like TV, film and stuff, some along the lines of that I, I was going to be a filmmaker. That's still a dream. I just need to get my last semester of classes done. Uh, I can already hear my mom telling me you need to do it. <laughs> but whenever I was in college, I was already developing this idea for what I was going to call the origin story, where I was going to bring on like, you know, again, actors, you know, writers, directors, producers and such and get their their idea on what got them interested what they want to do like what i'm doing now but like more based in the film field but as i develop more and as i once i got sort of away from that but not really i realized you know at least when it comes to like the directors and the actors and stuff like that they kind of already have that there's a million different podcasts that already gives them like the spotlight and stuff along the lines of that not saying that some of them don't deserve it and if any of them do want the opportunity to sit down and chat with me i'm not going to turn them away um but whenever especially whenever the quarantine started happening like i was consuming like a lot more art than i ever thought of like you know youtube with videos stuff like that being on twitter and seeing all the art that's on there that people were producing i'm like people need to give them that spotlight so that's why i started my podcast so mine, mine's a bit older than that i mean i started three years ago 
as I say, it was that thing of, and this has come up actually on your podcast before, where I keep thinking of Spaceballs. I don't know if you've seen Spaceballs. It might be better. Oh, I've seen Spaceballs. It's a great classic. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's a relief because <laughs> it's one of my favorite films. And um, I, I, I see your Schwartz is not as big as mine. <laughs> I didn't see you playing with your dolls again, sir. <laughs> but yeah, I keep thinking of the line, stop preparing. You're always preparing. Stop preparing. Just go. Right. And it's just that idea of yeah. just do it because you're going to be preparing forever and you just have to try because if you don't try it you're going to be a perfectionist and you're never going to do it because you're going to procrastinate forever so I just started it and I just gave it a go and I learned by making loads of mistakes the really really early episodes they're not bad but the you know the audio quality isn't great because I hadn't figured out what to do yet or we didn't really have much of a direction for the podcast yet I mean most of the early ones are my partner is a film historian and it's us oh, being real nerds about stuff <laughs> we'll just watch a movie together and then talk for about two or three hours about it so that was basically how it started there we go yeah <laughs> And it still doesn't have, I mean, the interview format is just one of the kinds of format that this can be, you know, it doesn't have oh, a yeah. fixed thing. So it's that thing of just give it a try because then you'll see and it's a bit like what you're saying. I mean, these things are out in the world and they can have their own legacy because once you put it on YouTube, hopefully somebody will find it at some point mm -hmm. because they just a search will hit the right thing and algorithms seo will pick something up i'm also surprised at times with the algorithm on youtube is one of the most complex things out there and like how many different like music videos or how many different like animated films that i watch whenever i'm watching a different kind of animated film from some other complete random artist because of that algorithm more than anything else that's how i found like a good number that's how I found one of my biggest loves for animation right now. Uh, Vivian Madrano, which if you've heard of uh, Has Been Hotel, Hell of a Boss, the Spin the Horse tunes. I just found a random video that she did to where she did like an animated video of Die Young by Kesha. That's how I first heard of her. It was like watching other animated music videos and stuff. And then next thing I know, like that got a lot of love. And then she starts posting teasers of this uh, Has Been Hotel. And then she released the pilot and the pilot gets over like 50 70 million views <laughs> like it's a big deal so it's one of those like if what i'm producing out there gets someone to at least click on the video that's all i can ask for i think it's tough because everything's feeling quite oversaturated i find you know it feels quite difficult to find certain things because there's so much content now and we're producing more and more all the time but yet what do we do? We can't just stop because there's loads of other people. Like, I mean, that's the thing. We all have a voice. So mm -hmm. it's about just trying to find a way to get it to reach somebody out there. Yeah. I mean, for me, I mean, I've gotten, I, I've mentally gotten to the point, like at least early on, whenever I was making the podcast, I've gotten to the point where I'm like, I don't care if it's only two people or two million people mm -hmm. that watch the podcast. At the end of the day, there's only one viewer that I'm trying to satisfy, and that is myself. If mm -hmm. I'm satisfied with a podcast and I sit down, I go back and listen, and there's a lot of the episodes, most of the episodes I go back and listen to. But if I go back and I listen to it and I enjoy it just as much as I did whenever I was sitting down having that podcast, I think I did a good podcast more than anything else. If the people decide to join in on the fun that I'm having, they're more than mm -hmm. welcome to. I am not going to turn them away. But at the end of the day, I again, I would greatly appreciate whatever numbers I can get. But as long as one person is satisfied and that one person is me, then I did a good podcast. Yeah, I think that's a really good way of putting it, Nathan, as well, because we have to start with ourselves and mm -hmm. we are the test audience for our own work, really. Because I think you can be you can be critical about it and you can be constructive about it, but I do that as well. I tend to listen to my own podcast, yeah. not because of me, but I mean, I think it's useful to listen back to yourself because that's how you learn to improve. But oh, yeah. also because I'm really fascinated by the guests that I have on and I think I think once you're when you're in interview mode like we are at the minute you know half of your brain is somewhere else because you're right as are we still recording is everything <laughs> going okay you know you're sort of concentrating on a couple of other things and you can't necessarily absorb plus my memory is terrible these days oh. and i like to just you know listen back over it when i've edited you because know, i'll edit the whole thing and then i'll i'll listen to it when 
when it comes out right because i like to know well i like to make sure that it's working because i'm still so paranoid that anything technological i'll ever do just is going to fall apart so it's good just to make sure oh that that worked that's good that plays on apple that's good there, there you go <laughs> no trust me i know i know exactly what you're talking about with that kind of stuff the Joe Horn episode that I keep bringing up, one of the biggest issues with that one is, so again, I had me and two other friends beside me. We were all sitting down. For some reason, my my brain did not think we should only have one microphone. No, my brain thought we should all bring our microphones <laughs> right here in this super close confined space and talk with one guy. So audio wise, that podcast was an absolute nightmare because there's a one point to where we decided, okay, we're going to use one mic. We're going to use this guy's mic because this guy's mic is good. We had that for a while. Then I'm like, wait, I have my own audio recording. I'll tell you what, I'll go ahead and turn on my microphone and then we'll just go and, you know, so at least have my little side one. But then I forgot to realize that the recording software that I used recorded both my microphone and his microphone and the guest and Joe Horn because he was on his phone so we could hear a little bit of our feedback through his phone and <laughs> Oh. so like the editing on that one was an absolute nightmare mm. there was a point to where for some reason his feed just completely cut out mm -hmm. and there was like a good 10 15 minutes where we we're just waiting there trying to figure out if he's gonna be able to come back because i tried messaging him a million different ways but at the end of the day like i after i'd done edited it i still go back and listen to that episode because the fun conversations that we've had and mm -hmm. such and like part of me is not like whenever i listen back to a podcast is not just you know listening and learning from myself it's going back and sort of reliving that funny experience i get yeah. with talking with these people because the guests i bring you know the, the people i bring on like i am proud of just about every single one of them i, I have a blast listening to them every single time <laughs> and like listening back to what they have to say and like almost learning again with that mm -hmm. kind of stuff because it, it again at the end of the day i'm making the content that i love to know about what i'd love to learn about and so like any insights that they give is an absolute blast that's great to hear it just occurs to me that i wondered how you felt about this as well because i think for such a long time i was someone who analyzed culture i analyzed film and then again one of the many reasons behind really starting this was wanting to be both an analyst and a producer of culture and i was wondering what you thought about that idea as well so that that, that sort of dual position there's nothing ever wrong with having that position with that stuff if you're not judging the culture around you then you're just being ignorant to whatever's going on and being ignorant not understanding the culture is not going to nourish you as someone that appreciates the culture and you know being a producer like you know if you're going to make content you know make sure you make it with a good purpose i mean if you think you're producing the content that you think is going to help the culture one way or another who am i to stop you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> i think part of us being podcast especially us being an art podcast is preserving the culture a little bit so in a way we're sort of helping with people understanding and analyzing the culture I'm sure you have on several occasions, like gone back to like, you know, seeing how movies were in like the 50s and 60s and 70s stuff and seeing the mentality that the world had then and seeing how different it is now. Well, the stuff that we're making right now, can you imagine what people, you know, 20, 50, 100 years from now, if they go back and find stumble upon this and analyze, wow, this is what their culture was like during this kind of situation. How much you want to bet that like at least two or three generations from now, people are going to be curious on how people were during COVID and they're going to go back to these podcasts and stuff and be like, mm. Like, wow this is how they got through covid yeah exactly yeah yeah i think about that quite a lot too because they're almost like covid diaries yeah it has completely changed how we work oh yeah no absolutely i was gonna say like you know we talked about before but like you said it yourself we're like the public access tv well have you ever gone back and see some of those old public access tvs and see just like how they did their stuff you know how, how they would set up their shows and like again getting that look into like their realities and such you know like if we were watching like movies in the 70s or something like that how much like the cold war may have influenced them to make certain movies mm -hmm. and such mm -hmm. like that's something that we're never going to experience but like as an analyst we can look back at how they're making movies in the 70s and such realize okay this is how they got through the potential existential dread that they could die tomorrow from mm -hmm. nuclear warfare mm -hmm. going back to like the 30s and such seeing all those like the classic looney tunes and such or like the classic cartoons where they they influence or they inspire people hey you should uh, go to war or you should help people you know invest in the military and such as an analyst you go back to like that's how they got through the potential dread that they could be air raided by germany tomorrow you know that's something to help them you know as an analyst you're always going to be looking back and so if we're making the stuff right now that other analysts can eventually look back on then it's going to benefit society at the end of the day absolutely yeah 
I feel like there's a lot they're going to have to sift well, through. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I imagine I imagine there's a lot of crap that we haven't really dug up back in the day that I'm sure. sure. And I mean, you know, people are going to go through the bigger names because those are the things that at least at the time for us, we, we look at that stuff and that's kind of the stuff that helps us get through like the bigger name stuff. But I imagine if people really want to do the research, like, yeah, there's going to be a lot of crap to sift through, but it's not like it's the first time people have had to sift through that kind of stuff to get what they're looking for. Yeah, yeah. I think these kind of digital media that we're producing they're going to be a lot more easily preserved oh, than yeah. you know say artifacts from a hundred years ago and so on but it's so much storage you know it's just so much stuff to have to store somewhere mm -hmm. and it does need physical storage space because we keep thinking that it's invisible but it's, it's not really <laughs> it needs physical storage <laughs> i know absolutely i mean i know it's still somewhat digital but i mean i keep all my episodes on a hard drive so i mean it's one of yeah. those i at least had that that's about the closest to a physical storage space that I have. This is just a quick interruption to say you can find out more at audiovisualcultures.wordpress.com where you can also sign up to our monthly newsletter straight to your inbox and listen to our latest episodes. Now keep enjoying this one, there is more great stuff to come. Nathan, is there anything we haven't touched on that you would like to bring up that you think is important? Well, actually, you know what? I'm going to flip the interview a little bit. I want to interview you for a quick second. Oh. Yes, I know. <laughs> I mean, I know you said yourself that you started this a couple of years back, but what really got you, what got you invested in like art in the first place? Like what made you like really go all in on it and realize this is the thing I want to at least invest in or talk about for the rest of my life? That's a really excellent question, actually. For me, that's probably quite a long answer, but I'll try and be concise. I mean, for me, so as I say, I... Uh, I studied film at university and I had really wanted to study English literature. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I did my, we do our A-levels here at school when you, at you're finishing your seniors in high school and okay. um, you finish with your A levels. So those are the exams you do to get your grades that will get you into university. So I really wanted to do an English literature degree and I got in to do that. And then when I was applying for university, I saw that you could study film and I didn't even know you could study film. And yeah. <laughs> all through my teens, you know, I had been watching very strange films, lots of art house films and lots of classics and stuff. And, and I was really obsessed with it with mystery science theater 3000 yeah <laughs> so um you know i was really into just all areas of film and you know i didn't care whether it was good or bad or what i just loved cinema so much in all its forms so really it was from that was really what got started so i did a joint honors degree i did both and then i just needed to do more films so i did a master's and then a phd um and then it was in my phd that i branched out into more looking at visual art as well as cinema there we go so i became looking into more where cinema and art converged they were mixing nice. more and more and modernist cinema and um what was happening with the likes of video art and things so sort of moving image art and and it just became very messy and slippery and i love all that i love that it was i got frustrated with the institution that everything had to be letterboxed and put in neat categories mm -hmm. And the work I was looking at was very messy, and I like the messiness of it. So um, that's kind of the fast version of all of that. There's always a, a beauty with kind of a disaster, sort of an, an organized mess more than anything else, <laughs> like how, how stuff goes down. So you said yourself that you this podcast initially started with just being basically a, a further extent on your film studies, like just analyzing yeah. films and sort of going with the history kind of stuff like that. Correct me if I'm wrong, it's kind of evolved at this point. I don't know if it still applies that but like it's also evolved to, you said yourself bringing on these industry people and like having them talk about their passion stuff like that are you personally happy with that evolution of the podcast like whenever you start compared to where you are now are you satisfied with the fact that this is where you are right now and you love what you're doing I think so yeah I uh, again another really good question 
I think so. I mean, I didn't anticipate this, very similar to yourself. I did not anticipate it breaking out the way that it did. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I think we were doing really good work in that sort of format of, right, we go and watch a film or we go to a museum for a day or we go to an exhibition or something and then we all discuss it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we were going to conferences, academic conferences about something and then maybe interviewing people at the conference, you know, doing different things like that. But I think what it has become, I think more recently, because it has, I think for about a year now, solid, it has become an interview show and not exclusively, but predominantly. And I'm really happy with that because when I started, I didn't imagine anyone would want to do this with me. So <laughs> I'm really <laughs> astonished that people are really, you know, people are getting in touch with me saying, can I be on your show? And I'm like, yeah, of course. <laughs> there we go now i was gonna say it's funny that you bring that up so the way that i the thing that convinced me more than anything else that i should do the podcast is just randomly one day i decided to pull up a notebook and i just wrote down a whole bunch of names of all sorts of different artists that i had admired i'm like you know what one of these days i want to interview as many of the people on this list as possible i posted on twitter i tagged as many people as i could that post them like basically convince me to do this podcast if i make this podcast who be down to be interviewing with me and i had a couple couple of responses from the artists themselves that I've had on that there. And one of them, the guy's name is uh, Super D, was one of the first people to respond. He said he was down. He was my first guest. Having that sort of convinced me to realize there are people that want to do this kind of thing. And I was all down for it. So I have to ask, uh, you said you got people like approaching you now. Why not come on this podcast? You've interviewed. How many people have you say that you would interview? Like, give me like a rough number, like a rough number. You don't have to give me exact, but like roughly like 50, 100, more, less. Yeah. So I would say at least 50, 50, okay. possibly more. So this will probably be episode 91 for us. There we go. And quite a few few of the episodes have been analysis of something mm -hmm. um, and not necessarily an interview but there are episodes where there are multiple interviews that's fair enough that's fair enough between 50 and 100 i would say is a good pitch okay. yeah and i imagine a lot of those people come from all over the world like you know america all over europe um mm. have you gone anywhere like you know japan or australia or any of the regions like outside of those the two major ones or has it been mainly those for now it's been mainly UK, Europe and the US. Yes, not for want of trying. There are times when, um, you know, I've been in touch with somebody and they've said they'd love to do it and they they have a regular collaborator who's maybe in Korea uh, or something. I said, well, would your, would your collaborator like to come on? Oh, they don't speak very gotcha. much English. Okay, I haven't got any Korean, so. I was mentally the same way with the Filipino uh, lady who was absolutely wonderful. It's one of those, like, I'd never had that kind of experience, but I was glad that she wanted to sit down and chat because it was just, it, it was just kind of one of those more or less getting a look into the window of their culture with how they do animation it was completely different and eye-opening. But back to my original point. So you've interviewed all these people like all over the world so far. What is the biggest lesson or the biggest takeaway that you've had so far through this podcast journey? Oh, gosh, that's a very good question. Um, and I hope you'll answer these as well for yourself because you're making my oh, job very easy for me right now. <laughs> <laughs> I feel very jammy. Uh, biggest lesson, I don't know. I think maybe coming to that realization that you're doing good work. Because one of my guests, Jack Bowman, who is a producer of audio drama, he told me, make good work. That's the mantra to live by. And that was something that somebody who a mentor to him told him years ago was make sure you do good work and everything else will follow from that. And I've really tried to live by that for the last lot of months since I interviewed him. Mm -hmm. You know, I've tried not to sweat it when I know I'm making good work. Because I, I think just having to face down what we think of as success, we have to change that because the way we put language on things is such a problem, I think. It makes people feel crap about themselves and yeah. they're not crap. They're brilliant. They're working so hard. They're doing their best. They're doing great things. And even, do you know what? Even if they're just doing good things, not amazing things, even if people are mediocre, that should be fine as well because they're doing something you know so I think that's a big thing for me it's a big reminder to me of we just have to keep going and we have to do good work 
then at least we can be proud of ourselves. And I think the podcast is really, you know, I always would have felt that before, but maybe not believed it enough. And I think I've really believed it recently. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, absolutely. I totally get where you're coming from. And I'll go ahead and answer that question as well, because Please do. I'd say I've learned two major lessons when it comes to podcasting. Number one is just no matter what, shoot your shot. You never know. You'd be surprised how many people would be interested and invested in sitting down and talking with you with this kind of stuff. Again, if you told me months ago that I'd be talking to someone who's got a video that's got over 70 million views on it, I'd be like, okay, that's insane. Why does this person even pay attention to me? But it's like, you know, that would never have happened if I had never sent the person an email and being like, hey, I'd love to just sit down and talk. And the fact that I got a response from them. There are several people that I've been amazed, like just how easy it was for me to get in contact with them and have them sit down and just talk because a lot of people, they want to talk. They want to showcase their love. They want to have that passion because that's the thing that they're going for. That's the thing that they're invested in. Like, why not fan the flames? You know, why not let that passion grow more than anything else? The other one that I've learned is just how connected the art community is and how supportive the art community is. I, I, I am this like upbeat person, but there are several times where I have that self-doubt about myself of like, is this worth it? Am I just wasting other people's time? You know, I, I constantly have that self-doubt, but then I turn around and I got like a friend that I've made through these podcasts and stuff being like, you know, yes, I love what mm. you're doing. Like, you know, you're doing great things and we'd love to see this thing grow. And like, there are several times to where like some of the people that I've had on the podcast and, you know, have them talk about their passion, like they're going through stuff and how the art community will rally around them. I recently had one guest who she was in the closet for the, like the longest time, like at least with her family. Like when it comes to social media, she was smart enough to make sure that, you know, hey, this is social media separate from like the family stuff. But like she finally came out of the closet and like basically told like the truth about who she was and like her girlfriend and all this kind of stuff like that. And it was like a weight off her shoulder and like the amount of support that was rallying around her for that moment. Like it was absolutely insane. Through the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, like this art community is more than willing to support you. And like in turn, you should be supporting them as much because at the end of the day like you guys are all in it together to create to basically express yourselves to create this vision that people want to see and like everyone's kind of in it for the same case that's been like the biggest lesson i the biggest takeaways i've had since i've started podcasting no those are really important things as well and some um, similar things have come up on mine too where it's people who realize that you know i think actually my previous guest dan said that it doesn't matter what you're making we're all creative people there you go and it's that empathy with each other means so much that ability to share because i think if you're creating anything at all you're laying yourself bare for people you know even us mm -hmm. doing this and talking like this you know it's an avenue or it's a platform not just for talking about ideas and profound art and you know all of this but this is how we feel about stuff mm -hmm. our knowledge comes from how we feel about stuff how we react to things i think so much of the time yeah just remembering that too it's at the bottom of it all we're all creative people whether you're an artist or not whether you're a filmmaker or a podcaster or a musician whatever it is you can label yourself all you want but there's creativity somewhere in all of us i think absolutely absolutely i mean that at the end of the day this is something i actually talked about with my first guest super d one of the things that he didn't want to see is like gatekeeping how some people would be like well you're not this kind of artist you're not this kind of thing this kind of stuff a community cannot thrive without support and the fact that there's that much love and support in the community for no matter how big or how small a person is doing it, as long as people are willing to put in the work for it as well and do the kind of stuff, it's absolutely incredible. And it's something that I'd love to see and hopefully help with growing with my podcast. Yeah, excellent. There's a nice parallel, I think, with the podcasting community and especially with indie podcasters. Mm -hmm. I think there's a very similar um, emphasis on helping each other and trying to pull each other up a bit. Somebody will put out on social media, these are the ideas I have. Does anybody want to add anything? And you'll just chuck stuff in the pot. You know and just advise oh, yeah. each other on stuff or i use this and i didn't think it worked but this one worked really well you know whether it's software or um a streaming service or whatever it is you know it's just pass on the information because guests have come on and one of my guests makes a vlog cast on youtube and you know he put me on to stream yard mm -hmm. which i'd never heard of before and i use that sometimes because i can't afford the fancy zoom <laughs> so <laughs> 
<laughs> can't afford the premium. Oh, no, so, I was gonna say Streamlabs is how I record my thing. I go on Discord. I I set it up through there and I record there. It's just learning all of these things. It's just learning, right? Because I know about Discord, but I didn't realize you could record on it until recently. Or I've guessed on things where they have something that's specific to their country that they're able to use and and get more than one person that way and stuff. You just learn all these different things, and then you have options. You have choices. You know, when you're oh, yeah. restricted, because I think I, the very first one of these I did, the very first remote recording I did was Skype, and Skype is fine and everything, but it's not ideal. No, it's never ideal. <laughs> <laughs> But at the same time, you know, would it, whatever you have to do in order to bring forth the product that you want, I mean, you go for it. I mean, like for me, Discord works well because a lot of people do have Zoom and such, but like Discord is free. Yeah. And a lot of these smaller artists don't want to have to pay money, uh, at least for me. You know, I don't want to pay money yeah, for that just yeah. yet. <laughs> but at the same time, like a lot of people, a lot of people nowadays, you'd be surprised how many people use Discord and stuff mm. when it comes to just like casual conversation and such. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, because I think I, it was something that a friend had put me onto because she'd started a reading group on it oh, okay. um so i find discord that way but i'm still learning how to use it because i'm an old millennial <laughs> <laughs> and it's very new for me <laughs> hey with but, art you're always learning stuff so it wouldn't hurt to know it <laughs> that's it i mean i'm from the sort of msn messenger generation oh uh, yeah okay i know exactly what you're talking about it's all a bit big for me <laughs> i was gonna say I, I was say i don't think i'm that much younger than you i'm aware of like all the the AOL messengers and all the what used to be the internet before the internet really blew up in the 2010s. I know, guys, it was our fault. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we started the emoticons that are now emojis <laughs> yeah yeah the emoticons crawled so that the emojis could run <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and boy have they run wild they jesus <laughs> you've thrown some really good questions at me there nathan i mean i'm a podcaster i try to think of good questions <laughs> yes me too but i think i'm i'm also from a place where it's not the done thing to interrogate each other so i am right, sort right, of right, in this right. tension where i'm like don't ask anybody anything and <laughs> you are a podcaster and you're interviewing this person ask them the question <laughs> i mean it goes it goes back to one of the things i've learned shoot your shot the worst they could say is no <laughs> that's it Do you want to point people to where we can find more information about your fabulous podcast and, you know, your socials and things? Do you want to just send people in those directions? What? Me talk about my podcast more? No, I don't need to. No, absolutely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can find the Postmodern Art Podcast on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Anchor, and most podcast streaming platforms. Um, I can't think of all of them on top of my head, but if you listen to podcasts and you know where to go, it's probably going to be on there. You can follow me on Twitter at Postmod Art Pod future updates and guest announcements and if you're interested if you loved hearing me and you want to help support me and also the artists that i brought on to make some of these designs i have a merch shop which is for us and the eu so you could easily be able to purchase as well is a uh, teespring.com slash stores slash pmap brilliant that's great nathan yeah so i mean is there anything more you want to add if i've forgotten anything at the end of the day no matter what just go out there and create something amazing. Even, even if no one else thinks it is, if you think it's amazing, go out there and create it. Do what you love. Follow your passion. Don't get distraught by everything else. Just do what makes you happy at the end of the day. And I just re remembered that you begin your podcast by asking <laughs> a certain question. Yeah. And I'm going to throw it at you now. You're going to throw it at me. Oh, boy. Yeah. Okay. So what is it? It's... um. What is your most unpopular art opinion? There we go. You said it perfectly. <laughs> I'll say it to be fair, I've asked it, what, over 25 times at this point. So I'm used to <laughs> asking that question. <laughs> but what is my most unpopular art opinion? I I'm going to get a lot of flack for this, especially considering the fact that some of the guests I've brought on. Anime is overhyped. Oh, yes. that's a okay. throw down. Because here's the thing. It's not that it's bad. There are bad animes out there. It's not that anime... People celebrate anime like is God. It is the end-all, be-all. Like it is the ultimate form when it comes to animation and such. 
what you have to realize that a lot of anime, at least a good 90% of it or whatnot, starts up as a manga that had basically a test run with an audience so that they already know what's going to work, what's not going to work. So it already weeds it down and they basically produce the best that it is. Meanwhile, in America or other places, whenever we try to create anything that's based on a previous property, people are like, oh, they're an original. They're putting it, you know, they should flex their creative muscles. Meanwhile, that's 90% of anime. When it comes to anime, and I mean, it's one of those like anytime something new comes out when it comes to anime people are already like jumping on board and stuff like that at the end of the day if you love anime that's great but don't worship it like it's a god all right it's one of those <laughs> it is a medium at the end of the day that people are going to love and again it's already had a test run 90 percent of people already know what's going to happen on the show before it happens on the show so it's one of those like don't discredit western animation just because the eastern animation is doing successful because of what they already know to do that's why i say mm -hmm. anime is overhyped interesting answer love it i like to at least think it's a somewhat educated answer too you know it is it is because it isn't just well it's not as good as everybody thinks it is it is a very informed answer yeah. and i appreciate it that's fantastic mine is not anywhere near as interesting i think mine is more along the lines of yoko ono was better before john lennon okay the way around. okay okay now I, i'm interested to hear this care to elaborate on that opinion i think yoko ono um has always been a fantastic artist right. and i think there's so many beatles fans who just give off about her you know oh she ruined the beatles she ruined john lennon but i think it's the other way around i think he <laughs> i think she was doing really amazing work and then he came along and now she's doing amazing work again yeah i mean to be fair i mean you know people get sort of all sorts of influences from all sorts of other things just because you haven't been with john lennon doesn't mean that you don't understand where she's coming from <laughs> yeah well i do yeah because i just um i'm not a beatles fan and i mean there's an unpopular opinion right there not being a beatles fan <laughs> well exactly exactly i was more of a i'm more of a kinks person okay like, like the kinks you know if you're you're one or the other i'm more on the kinks side of things i don't really rate the beatles very much i got you but that aside i think you go no i think she just became so overshadowed by john lennon that her artwork people didn't really bother suffer from it yeah i think so i think she did some really really challenging stuff i mean i think especially with the films she was making with the fluxists mm -hmm. really pushed some boundaries she's done some really cool stuff in the early 1960s so anyway that's mine okay. that's mine i've said it. it's in the world it's out there in the world you can't take it back now unless you edit it out of the podcast <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, it's been so much fun, Nathan. I've really, really enjoyed this. You're Absolutely. very welcome back anytime. I might take you up on that offer. What's your time next week? No, I'm joking. No. <laughs> No, you are. You, you're very, very welcome. It'd be okay. great. If you ever want to collaborate on something, that'd be cool. Uh, duly noted. Duly noted. I am always yeah. looking for guests. I might I might flip the chair around and have you sit down on the Postmodern Art Podcast. I'll just, <laughs> I, I have a good bit scheduled coming up when it comes to guests, so it might be a little bit, but I would love to have you on the podcast as well. Excellent. Yeah, I'd love, I'd really, really love that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's been so, it's been such a pleasure Absolutely. talking with you tonight. It's been great. And I hope you have a brilliant rest of your day and really good luck with your podcast i'm sure it'll it'll find who it needs to find thank you thank you and i i wish the same onto you and then some because you've been doing this a lot longer than i have i'll tell you that much <laughs> but at the same time like you said we're basically you know we're basically two in the same boat at this point like the people that you're bringing on it's different than like what i'm bringing on as well so it's like you know there's a different flair for a different person and that's the beauty when it comes to art there's so many different tastes there's so many different cultures and such that whoever you bring on should definitely inspire those that love that culture and stuff so i i'm rooting for you a million times over oh same here same here thank you so much thank you for the opportunity This has been a Cozy Peapod production with me, Paula Blair. The music is Common Grounds by Airtone, used under a non-commercial 3.0 Creative Commons license and is available at ccmixter.org. We are AV Cultures Pod on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter and you can also join the conversation on Discord. If you've enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe on your favourite podcast app, including YouTube if you find auto captions useful and please share with your networks. You'll find links and ways to contact us at audiovisual 
socialcultures.wordpress.com. We're always really happy to hear from potential guests and ways to improve the show. As well as supporting the pod and receiving member benefits over on Patreon, you can also help at buymeacoffee.com forward slash PEA Blair. Thanks so much for listening. Catch you next time. Thank you.